It begins with a song. like work music. We hum songs to ourselves, keeping focus, working, stable, yet comforted. fish and tomato and onion and fried dumpling and breadfruit and sweet plantain among so many other things if I could somehow bottle that aroma and take it with me every time I felt lost somewhere It begins with a song, a song hummed to oneself, like work music. It's everything I remember. And it starts there.
parties, the festivals, with reggae, soca, calypso, dances from our family, our friends, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Dominican Republic, Haiti, back here, yes, it's a privilege to be back here in New York, and well, uh, thank you all for coming this evening to the Music Speak series. I don't know if you know, but my A string completely went out in that last Ligeti performance, so <laughs> crazy things happen on stage, yes? <laughs> well, my name is Jordan Bach, and I'm a violist, but of course you knew that because you have tickets, but <laughs> I am pleased to, and really honored to introduce you to my first special guest of the night is my very own grandmother, Miss Miriam Clark, from Far Rockaway. A big round of applause. And so you have many fans here, Graham. Um, but I think, I think, um, you know, your coming to this country, I think, is a, it's, it's a really important part of the story of, you know, how we are even you know, here in the first place. Um, so if you had to think about um, kind of going back to that time of, you know, being a young woman coming to the United States from Jamaica, um, what was your mission and what did you want to accomplish and maybe, you know, some of the, the barriers that you had to face coming here? Okay, the first thing, I was grateful getting the opportunity to be here mm -hmm. because when I was in Jamaica, I have four children and I, education was on the priority in my life for my children to get the opportunity to be whatever they want to be and uh, that is why I left because mm -hmm. I had my career, profession, whatever, mm -hmm. but for my children, I said, okay, let me make the journey. Mm -hmm. And that is paramount. That's where we are. And I think it's a really great point because it's, it's so, I think, instilled in so many, and really everybody in our family to, you know, achieve the, the highest possible and work and really hold your head up high and to achieve your dreams no matter what they are. Um, 
and I think a reflection of that is the strong family ties that we have as a family and sort of the bond that we have. And I know, you know several of us are in the audience tonight, so thank you all for coming. But um, what would you say, I guess, would you say in, in a sense that it adds to your strength as an individual to kind of have other people in a community to help you along the way? Yes. Um, I couldn't do it alone. Mm -hmm. I had help from many people, not just people from Jamaica, but people from all the people that I, that was in my life. Mm -hmm. um, the people with whom I work, with whom I you know, go to religious services with, ones that lived in the community. Mm -hmm. It was basically many, 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 it was many um, facets mm -hmm. that helped me to tie my life together here. Yeah. And, you know, I enjoyed it. It was difficult sometimes mm -hmm. because I'm leaving from the known, coming into the unknown. Yeah. And it wasn't easy just to find directions to go from point A to point B to mm -hmm. get to work, and also knowing how to negotiate the educational system to place each of my children where they would be able to maximize their potentials. Mm -hmm. Especially in this city. <laughs> yes. So if you don't know, I think my grandmother has one of the most distinct laughs. And it's so infectious, and I think you might have heard that in the recorded audio of reverberating off the walls, which is kind of that inspiration for that. And you've always said, you know, in life, you just have to laugh. <laughs> what would you That's say? That's my motto. Exactly. And so, and so what would you say to all of us sort of convening in this space tonight, you know, when, when things aren't so great in life and when, you know, you have, you know, that sort of journey that you have to face? From uh, my background, my grandmother told me not to go to bed um, angry or depressed or frustrated because that will take away from the, ne the energy. It will produce negative energy and you need a positive energy to start the next day. Just go back, find your mistakes, and then say, how can I do it differently to achieve maximum potential. Wise words, everybody. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you, Graham, here. Once again, Miriam Clark, everybody. Thank you. Terrific. And so Grandma has always been, to so many of us, sort of a, a symbol and, and just, you know, an incredibly powerful woman, but someone who has, you know, compassion, and there's always been a sense of community both within the family and outside of that. Um, and I thought it would be such a great pairing um, to put together a amazing piece of music. Um, but first, I'd love to just introduce a dear friend and longtime collaborative partner, Ji Young Lee, on piano, who's here tonight. <laughs> And so we'd like to perform the first movement of the Rebecca Clark Sonata. You know, it just has such a passionate, powerful opening, but there are incredible moments of delicacy, and it's just a damn good piece of music. <laughs> so the first movement of the Rebecca Clark, hope you enjoy it. Thank you.
thank you so much. Wasn't that, that quark was really amazing. I mean, it's just a terrific piece of music. Amazing. And it's, you know, it's such a pleasure to be here. You know, it's been a moment of reflection for me, being an artist of color, really, um, and performing here on stage in Merkin Hall among so many other venues now that we're getting back into live performances again uh, in this country. Um, you know, when I started, you know, taking music very seriously, well, I always took my music very seriously, but when I, when I began to sort of see the prospect of that as a career, I didn't see very many people um, like me in the arts and, and even, you know, different and darker and, you know, with, with this hair and these features. And, you know, when you, um, when you don't see those people, the prospect of you even getting into, you know, a good music school um, and feeling well represented in the student body, even making a living in this business, it sort of begins to, to look bleak. And, you know, it's an interesting parallel um, to think about that with this, you know, particular instrument, the viola. Um, you know, for so many years, it's been, you know, the middle child in the violin family, and it's been overlooked and underloved, really. And, of course, the subject of so many jokes, as we know, yeah? Always hear them, never get tired of them. <laughs> but it's never seen as dazzling or as brilliant as some of its, its siblings. And it, you know, in a way, it's probably the black sheep of, of the family. Um, it's imperfect, but there's something about it that's just incredibly human and vulnerable. Um, it has its own flaws. But I think you know, we're moving in a direction with newer compositions to bring those aspects of it out and um, to you know, bring it to the forefront of you know, string composition. And I think we've really come a long way. There's so many different types of sounds that we can make with this instrument. We can make it choke and, and you know, growl and whisper and wail uncontrollably. There are really so many possibilities um, besides, you know, just your kind of the usual melodic middle section in the chamber music, uh, string quartet or an ensemble. And so what I thought I'd do is play a little bit, this is just an excerpt of um, a piece by Kortog from the Science Games and Messages. This was, uh, I was inspired to do this by the wonderful violist Jennifer Stum. This is the beginning of the Wailing Song. draws you in, um, but we can also, we're extraordinarily capable, as you know. So I think we can shove those jokes about violists being bad violinists because we can be extraordinarily virtuosic as well. We can be Niccolo Paganini if we wanted to. We have so many different um, types of sounds and we can keep up and we can play with different colors and different flavors while doing it. Um, and so speaking of Niccolo Paganini, um, there's a piece of music that I absolutely love and I'm, I program it from time to time. It's uh, it composed in homage to Paganini and his incredible ability. It's the Capriccio in C minor by Henri Viotin. Thank you.
Wonderful, wonderful, thank you so much. You know, it's a beautiful picture of a sunrise, and you know, we're very much in the season of autumn, and I can't believe we're already approaching Thanksgiving season, unbelievably. Um, you know, we've made it um, a long way during this pandemic, and I just want to take a moment to really, you know, think about really how lucky we are to be here in tonight's space. So, you know, bravo to all of you for doing what you can to, you know, stay healthy and vaccinated and to be here in the space tonight. Really, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Um, and, you know, it is worth mentioning that, that it, it's, fall is being here and seeing the change of the leaves and, and feeling the chill in the air, you know, it's a very, um, we're lucky to be able to see autumn this year and to experience that. Um, you know, both of my parents are healthcare workers in Queens. My mom is here in the audience tonight. My, my father, unfortunately, couldn't make it because he's at work. <laughs> but just, you know, I just wanna take a moment to thank both of them and really to all other healthcare workers in the city that you know. So a big round of applause to all of our healthcare workers. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to, to introduce uh, the next piece on the program, and I think it's a really special one, and it's come to be one of my favorite pieces, and this is called A String Around Autumn by Toru Takemitsu. Um, we'll, ah, there it is, that's the guy, that's him. He was just an incredible um, Japanese composer and wrote a number of works, ranging from duos and trios and quartets to you know, um, pieces for orchestra, and um, he had this sort of a dreamscape, like modern kind of impressionistic um, compositional language. He was, uh, his music was once referred to, and this is a little paradoxical, but once referred to as subtly intense. <laughs> yeah, doesn't sound like, it doesn't sound like there could possibly be a thing, but I, I, I really think it is. Um, a string around autumn is a little bit of a play on words, and in this case it's for the strings of the viola and in this arrangement of the piece, also the strings, the many strings underneath the mallets of the piano. And what he does with all of those strings is really incredible, especially uh, the opening of this character piece um, in the piano melody. Um, it reminds me of that sunrise pictured before. So, you know, kind of thinking of where we are at this moment, um, if we could imagine, you know, waking up, let's say, by a fireplace on you know, a chilly Wednesday morning, which might be tomorrow. It's Tuesday, don't forget. Um, and to just imagine that sunrise kind of unfolding just in the present moment, not past or future, but just as it unfolds. Um, and I hope you really enjoy this one. This is the Takemitsu, A String Around Autumn. Thank you.
guys. Well, I am uh, pleased, of course, to introduce my second special guest on the program. This is Arianelle Arroyo, and she is a student of mine. How about a round of applause? <laughs> so, Arianelle, do you want to just, just introduce yourself, tell them what year you're in, and maybe what organizations you're part of? So, hello, my name is Arianelle Arroyo. I'm currently 17 years old, and I am a senior at LaGuardia High School. I attend the MAP program at Juilliard, as well as the Opportunity Music Project. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> so of course, Arianelle studies with me. I am, I am faculty at Opportunity Music Project. Um, for those of you that don't know, and I think there are a couple of other OMP students in the audience tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Um, OMP is an organization that involves teaching um, young students from beginner level to really where Arianel is now. Um, you know, teaching young students who have that desire to learn a musical instrument to the best of their ability through subsidized or fully funded lessons. And otherwise, you know, many of them otherwise would have not had um, proper music instruction. And OMP is something that I wish that sort of existed, um, or it just had been somewhere in New York City or any other major cities when I was, you know, starting out. Because, you know, somehow in a student's education, we've like convinced ourselves that music is not as important as some other subjects, mathematics, science, physics. And of course, it is, you know, equally as important in some cases, you know, much more, but you know, let me tell you something. If you want to see more artists, like the two of us on stage, you have to, you have to, you have to invest in the beginning stages of music learning. It has to happen. <laughs> and it's a privilege to have Arianelle in my studio as well as so many other um, young musicians. And so what I thought I'd do um, is invite Arianelle to this concert to perform a little bit of a duet. It's gonna be a fun uh, little performance of the Telemann Concerto, the second movement of the Telemann Concerto for two violas. So it's a real privilege for me. Thank you so much.
something, it's incredibly freeing and gratifying to find yourself, to be stubborn, to own your image and your voice. Because it's your voice and it's your light that inspires others. Use that voice to turn on the light bulb in someone else. Inspire the next generation of musicians and people. For a future in music and in life that is incredibly bright. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, we've made it to the final guest on the program, and it's a really special one for me and for, um, you know, really my entire family. Um, be nice to get her on the screen there. Yeah. It's been really hard, yeah. Um, so this was my aunt, um, Anna Clark, and she was a very bright star. Um, and she tragically passed away three years ago, and I think it might be sort of the first time that you know, my family has talked about it openly. Um, it was a shock to us all, and as, as a family and just as a human being, how do you move from that? You know, how do you... Uh, get to a point where you can, you know, accept what has happened and sort of move on in life as a human being. I remember the funeral, you know, in Queens, and I played some Bach, and I shared a few laughs of, you know, our time together, um, and I didn't shed a tear. You know, maybe I should have. Um, maybe the strategy there was, was um, stability, you know, to be some sort of beacon, maybe. Um, so this way other people can you know, within the family can sort of express their grief outwardly. Um, but I did, you know, I did grieve, and it really hit me about maybe a year after that. Um, and not in the traditional way. Um, it manifested really in the way that I approach my life and my career and my art, you know, and the way that I present myself here as being so much more um, stripped down and raw and, and unapologetic because, look, life is incredibly short, you know, and we don't have a lot of time here. Nobody does. And tomorrow isn't guaranteed. And what is the point of wasting so much time sort of creating this cookie-cutter image of yourself and programs and things relating to the businessy aspects of your career to you know, to appeal to people who are comfortable in tradition and expect to come here, um, you know, knowing exactly what they're gonna hear and leaving with things done the exact same way. That's not why I'm here. And, you know, I think that's what Anna would have wanted is to be shameless and unforgiving, but most of all, to be the inner you. And, you know, we connected at the beginning when grandma was on stage about holding your head up high and working as hard as you can and earning, um, your position in the world, and you know, for us as minorities, and especially in this business, we don't just hold our head up high just to be proud of our work. We hold our head up high because we don't have a choice, because we have to. And so you get up here on the stage and you show people how the show is done. And I think she would have done it the exact same way. And I think the perfect piece 
to, to pair with that um, is really a heart on your sleeve kind of a piece. It's the Kodai Adagio, and it's been a real um, privilege to discover this piece, and so I'd like to share that with you, but I'd like to share with you, um, I'd like to dedicate that to everybody in my family, including the ones that are here, my beautiful wife who's in the audience uh, tonight, um, and to this one up there. <laughs> so the Kodai Adagio, I hope you enjoy it.
Thank you, thank you. Um, you know, this program is titled Into the Light. And I'm sure you've noticed, you know, some of the different lighting uh, scenes overhead um, and the different images and, and, you know, so on. But there's a symbolic meaning behind that, um, that if we take stories and experiences of underrepresented artists and people and tell them through the musical lens of, in this case, an underrepresented instrument uh, for so many years, um, then I think we can pave the way for a much brighter future in classical music and music in general, and in turn, in life. And so I'm afraid we are coming to the end of the program. I know it is so sad, but I just want to take a moment to thank um, Kauffman Music Center, American Concert Hall, um, everyone really from Concert Artists Guild, um, all of our collaborators here tonight, um, all of our, our lighting and our sound, and everybody on the crew here at Kauffman Music Center. You've made it such um, a terrific experience being here, and of course, all of you tonight who have come to join in this space. So really, thank you to everybody. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, And I think it's really fitting to end the program with just a, a one of the most amazing um, composers, in this case, BIPOC composers, H. Leslie Adams. Um, and he has uh, an incredible um, set of songs called Night Songs. Um, and I'd like to, you know, they're, they're not for the viola, but of course, um, the viola is such a human instrument, and I think it works really well um, for the, both the viola and the piano. We're going to finish with two songs tonight. First, The Heart of a Woman, and lastly, Prayer. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you.